Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. Today I bring you some of the latest and the greatest, and again, latest and greatest in uh, watch terminology is sort of a loose term. Usually the latest and the greatest tre can stretch back a year. A lot of times they'll offer models out at Basel, SIHH, and then you don't end up seeing those things six months to a year later. So what did I bring? I brought the latest Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Grand Complication. I also brought the Bulgari Octo Finissimo to date the thinnest watch out there or the thinnest movement out there, record that they broke from 1967. And I brought the Daytona white dial ceramic. Again, I know you guys seen this, this came out more than a year ago, but nevertheless, I thought I'd bring this out there because this is the latest Daytona. This is arguably the number one selling watch in the world to date. I'm gonna start with probably my favorites in the bunch. And I hate to pick favorites because you know, these watches are so different and so different in price, so different in style, so different in terms of brands. But I'm gonna start with the Bulgari Finissimo. This is a watch you guys saw all over Instagram, all over social media, all over the internet, right after Basel last March. And this, why, why, and it made quite the buzz. And the reason for that is because again, look at this watch. This is the thinnest watch to date. The last record that was held by the thinnest watch out there, just to put this in perspective, was by Vacheron Constantine, dating back to 1967. Just to show you how hard it is to do something like this. There hasn't been a watch since then that has broken that record, and this watch indeed did, and rightfully so. <laughs> Look at how thin this watch is. It is absolutely ridiculous. I want to put this in perspective. Let me see if I can find a quarter in here somewhere. Uh, do I have any change, Roman? Yeah, Roman has change. Oops. So here's a quarter. I'm gonna set that right on top of the watch to give you an idea of just how thin this watch is, okay? Let me take two quarters to give you a better perspective. It's about the size of two quarters. It's 5.15 millimeters thick. Look at this watch. Actually, two quarters are actually gonna be thicker than the watch. Now, what do I love about this watch? Well, number one, to me, it's a gimmicky watch. The fact that it's the thinnest watch in the world right there sells me. The fact that it's a Bulgari watch, does not. The fact that it's a Bulgari watch, most people are like, eh, it's a Bulgari watch. Who cares? I don't care if it's Bulgari, I don't care if it was Vacheron, I don't care if it was IWC that did this. Bottom line is, is this is the thinnest watch in the world. It's, it's an extremely light watch. It's made in titanium. It's got a brushed titanium finish. This watch is actually very plain Jane, but yet it carries a large size. Now, when you typically think of the ultra, of an ultra thin watch like Piaget of Vacheron, the first thing you think of is a, is a dressy watch on a strap. Not with this guy. This is an avant-garde design. This is a large watch. It's 40 millimeters across and even more going from top to bottom. It's got the typical Octo design in it. The bracelet I absolutely love. I love the fact that it's a thicker bracelet around the case rather than the Punia bracelet, kind of like the first Deep Sea when it first came out. We had a big head and the Punia bracelet didn't get that at all. Uh, the, the bracelet continues to taper down in a, actually a pretty decent fashion. It's extremely comfortable in the wrist. I put this watch on. I think it's a gorgeous watch. I love the fact that they actually display the thin movement in the back. Look at that. You can see the entire movement in the back, and I love the fact that they actually showed it. They took it a step further. They made it in a skeleton version, and I brought that as well. Let me show you this guy. Hey, you can see right through it. Look at that. Now, this shows off the movement in its entirety, front and back. This one is, again, in titanium, happens to have a black PVD finish. They made a few variations. They made it in a rose gold. They made it in titanium, brushed titanium. They made it on a strap. They made it without a strap. There are a few variations of it. You can go on Bulgari's website, and you can check that out. So what is it that I love about this watch the most? The fact that it's super light, the fact that it's a nice large size. If I put this watch on a wrist, and let me just do that in comparison, I'm wearing an offshore right now, which is a, it's a very large watch. But if you look at the watches side by side, look at the size, it's a large size watch. It is extremely, extremely comfortable on the wrist. And last but not least, this is a huge conversation starter for anybody who's a watch nerd out there. If you have this on your wrist, you can definitely talk about this watch for hours. This, there's something to be said what Bugley did this year. And I think this is a great feat. I think this is something that puts them on the map further as a watch house rather than just a jewelry house. And I mentioned before, I think Bulgari jewelry is probably some of my favorite jewelry today in comparison to the, some of the other big boys like Cartier or Harry Winston or Van Cleef. The moment that they made the design, the overall design of the watch, 
it's an A plus all around. Look at these two beautiful watches. And when I first got them, I put them on Instagram and I got a lot of DMs. I got a lot of questions about this watch and everybody was telling me, hey, put it on what's on my desk. And I was just hoping not to sell them before I get a chance to do that. And here they are side by side. Absolutely, probably the best buy I made in the last 30 days. These things are not gonna last. They're not that easy to find because they are selling out at the boutiques at full pop. What do they retail for? Well, the plain Jane is 13,900 on the bracelet. The skeleton is 23,600. What do I think about the pricing? Do I think it's pretty hefty? Absolutely not. You're talking about a horological feat in year 2018. Rightfully so, they should charge the amount of money that they're charging for these pieces. Are they gonna trade over list? No, if they made it into a limited edition, I guarantee they would trade over list. Because these are regular production watches, you will get a discount on them. Not a big one. These watches are trading anywhere from 15 to 25% off list, depending on how good a deal you can get. If you can find one, because you know what? Dealers are holding on to this. These are flying off the shelves at retails. People are actually walking into the boutique and paying full retail for both of these versions, especially the skeleton one, because it's so gorgeous. Um, what do I see the future in a secondary market as far as resale? They will hold their value. Now, I'm not sure how many pieces they're going to make, and I'm not sure if making a limited edition was probably was the better move with these pieces, but I do feel that it was actually a good thing that they didn't make it a limited edition. They didn't jump on the bandwagon of making something limited. They knew this was gonna be a seller for them, and they wanna capitalize on it. When you set a world record on something, especially in watchmaking, which is very rare, you wanna capitalize on it. And I don't blame it because I guarantee you they spent a whole lot of money into research and development before they were able to actually make these watches and rightfully so they should be capitalizing and sell as many as they can. Next, I'm gonna talk about briefly about the Rolex Daytona. I mentioned this watch in various episodes of q and I, I mentioned this watch in various episodes of What's On My Desk. And boys and girls, lo and behold, here's the number one selling watch in the world. Again, not much variation from its original design. You can go back 30 years and the Daytona looked the same, same pushers, same case size, same braces, same buckle. And guess what? At a glance, it looks just like any other Daytona with the exception of the addition of the ceramic bezel. And guess what? I don't think there's a Daytona design out there that you can do with Rolex that will not be successful because for years and years and years, the Daytona has always traded over its retail value. And today, case in point, this watch retails at around that $20,000 mark, about $5,000 over its original retail price, and it's gonna continue doing so. It's not gonna slow down, it's not gonna go down anytime soon. This has been the number one collector watch, this has been the number one purchase watch, this is the watch that's recognized worldwide, and I particularly brought the white dial because this is indeed my favorite combination and the best selling one. And the reason for that is because if you take the black dial, Daytona with the ceramic bezel, it tends to blend in with the bezel. Where here, the panda dial as well as the black ceramic bezel is outstanding against the stark white dial. I was asked before if I like the, if I'm, which watch would I would go with, Skydwell or Daytona in one of the previous episodes, and I said the Daytona, and this would be the Daytona that I would go with, the ceramic Daytona with the white dial. Absolutely love this watch. A timeless classic. It was, it is, and it will be. Last but not least, I saved the best, so I should say the most expensive for last, and this is the new version of Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Grand Comp. Boys and girls, this is a $730,000 watch. Wow. What makes it a grand comp? Well, first and foremost, it is an automatic movement. It is a minute repeater. You can see the lever on the side and I'll set that off in a second. It is a perpetual calendar and it is a chronograph. Not only is it a chronograph, it is a split second chronograph. So take all that and put it into one watch and skeletonize it on top of that and you get the Audemars Piguet grand comp in titanium. Now, split second chronograph, set that off, split it put it back, stop it, and reset it. It's not a flyback chronograph. Minute repeater. Now, I mentioned this watch is made in titanium, and I think I spoke about various minute repeaters before, and lately the trend has been, or the general consensus is that minute repeaters sound best in titanium. Well, you guys be the judge. Let me shut this guy off and That sounds amazing, in my opinion, but you guys be the judge, you let me know what you think. Now let's talk about resale value or sales on this particular watch. Now I picked this watch up roughly about a month ago and it's still sitting in my vault. 
uh, not sold yet. And the reason for that, because there's not a whole lot of guys out there buying these super expensive watches. Because there's not a whole lot of guys out there that A, can afford this kind of watch, and even if they can't afford it, they're not necessarily the kind of guys that are going to drop $700,000 on the watch. Now, what is this watch selling at? Because of the limited production, because this being a brand spanking new model, no, this watch is not trading at half price like some of the other grand comps from the past. This watch is actually trading closer to its retail value. It trades at about $550,000 today. Um, is it something that's going to sell quickly at that price? No, again, because there's not a lot of guys out there that can afford to buy this kind of watch, nor do they want to splurge that kind of money on the grand comp. Is this watch going to sit in my safe for six months to a year? Absolutely not. It'll be probably gone within the next 30 days. The reason for that is because there is a gas for every seat, as they say. So I'm not concerned in regards to selling this particular watch. I was more concerned about actually having this watch in stock. And it took me quite a while to find one, find one at a right price that was worthy of stocking. And I finally put my hands on one. And I'll be honest with you, uh, as much as I'm not going to wear this watch, this watch is in brand new condition, so this isn't something I'm going to put on my wrist and risk messing up. It's going to sit in my vault neatly wrapped in plastic out of which I just unwrapped it. But it's going to be one of those watches that I am going to be sad to see go. Every so often, like much like these Bulgaris or much like this Daytona, there's watches out there that I absolutely love and I sort of get a personal attachment to. And oftentimes when they sell, I'm actually pretty sad to see them go. And I, the next thing I do is I try to get out there and buy another one. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. As usual, I'm gonna end it with showing you what's on my wrist. And today I'm wearing the new 45 millimeter offshore. It's the PVD case with the ceramic bezel with the gray dial. Uh, surprisingly comfortable at 45 millimeters. Uh, doesn't really dig into your side of wrist because the crown doesn't pop out as much. It's a big look and it's just a mean looking watch, which is kind of why I like this watch. Uh, not a watch for those that beat their watches up, myself included, because of the PVD finish. So I'm gonna try to be somewhat careful while I'm wearing this watch for the next couple of days. Guys, if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're not subscribed to my channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And I'll see you guys next time for more watch reviews and other videos.